I want to revisit that subject, danger zones. I want you to really allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you because no matter how good your life is right now, remember this, that you have an enemy who never sleeps nor never slumbers and he is always coming after you. He'll leave you for a season, but he will return. So let this word minister to your heart and let it help you to gauge where am I right now in my walk with God? Am I strong in the Lord and the power of his might? Or am I heading toward a danger zone? Turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Peter 5, 1 through 9. And I want to continue talking about danger zones. And, and David, can you just keep playing that softly? I, I, I like that. And I want to talk about when we're most at risk and continue that. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 9 says, The elders who are among you I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder, and this is Paul, uh, Peter talking, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion but willingly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed in humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Father, I thank you. Thank you for your word. It is the word, but it is truth. And Lord, there may be facts about us that we don't like, but I thank you that truth has the power to change the facts. And so we speak truth under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. May it be so that it's not just words that I've typed out and put on a piece of paper, but these are words that you have first birthed in my spirit, the truth of your word. And then Holy Spirit, help me to convey it to those that are listening. Father, as I always pray, and I pray it not because it sounds pretty, but we need it. Give us ears that hear, eyes that see, hearts and a desire to draw nearer my God to thee. And Lord, I'm thanking you now that as good as we were coming in, we're going to be much better going out. Because you said your word would not return to your you void. It would go out and it will do what you send it to do. Now I'm asking you, Jesus, rebuke the devourer. Holy Spirit, rain on the word, the seed of the word. Let it pop up and bring life. And I thank you for it. Because it's going to be done. Because I ask it in the name that is above every name. The mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Before you see it, tell the person next to you, you're so brave you made it. <laughs> and then you may be seated. You made it to the house of the Lord. <laughs> the story is told of a zoo that was noted for their great collection of animals. And one day the gorilla died and to keep... To keep the appearances of full range of animals, the zookeeper hired a man to wear a gorilla suit and to fill in for the dead animals. So this man put on his gorilla suit. It was his first day on the job, and the man didn't know how to act like a gorilla very well, and so he tried to move more convincingly, and he got too close to the wall enclosure. He tripped and he fell over into the, over into the lion exhibit. Let me have your mic, Lady Brenda. This one just keeps breaking up on me. That was such an interference, I'm going to start the story all over again. <laughs> Let me say it again. The story is told of a zoo that was noted for their great collection of animals. One day the gorilla died, and to keep up appearances of full range of animals, the zookeeper hired a man to wear a gorilla suit and to fill in for the dead animals. It was his first day on the job, and when that man didn't know how to act like a gorilla very well, but he tried to move convincingly, and when he did that, he got too close to the wall, and he tripped, and he fell into the lion exhibit. He began to scream because he was convinced his life was over. That was until the lion began to speak to him and said, Be quiet, you're going to get us both fired. 
Doesn't that remind you of what we've been talking about in the church? Just because somebody looks like a Christian, it doesn't make them a Christian. We've been talking about separating the authentic from the synthetic. We've been talking about the reality that there are many, many people sitting in churches. And I heard one preacher say this, that he's concerned that many of them think they're going to heaven, but are not going there. And what he began to talk about was this reality that I've taught you for the last few weeks. In the body of Christ today, in the modern day church, we have what I call many, many moral hazards. And they're running amok in the body of Christ. What is a moral hazard? It's when someone takes on the life of Christ and is irresponsible or negligent with that life. But I'm so glad, and I felt this in my spirit when I was praying, that I believe that I am dealing with a majority in this house that truly wants to be authentic and not synthetic. I believe that I am pastoring by the grace of God, a group of people. You are serious about taking responsibility for the life of Christ in you. You are serious because you don't want to become one of those people that is hit by the disease of moral hazardry. You see, I believe that we are desiring as a church to bring glory and honor and praise to the name of Jesus. But I want to remind us of something. We all need to be careful about pointing our finger at other people when they slip and they miss the mark. Because I want to tell you this, that every last one of us, except for the grace of God, at any moment, at any time, we could find ourselves in trouble as well. That any one of us, we are one or two poor decisions away of blowing away all of our visions, our dreams, and our hopes. And if we're not careful, even our own lives. Peter warns us like this. He says, be sober, be vigilant, be on guard because you have an adversary. And I think this is very important that I say this again. We need to understand that our adversary is not people. People are not your adversary. The devil may use them, but your adversary is the devil. And the Bible says that this evil one, he roams about seeking someone who is not on top of your spiritual game so that he might suck you into this place called the vortex of the danger zone. And if you do not respond appropriately and timely, he will devour you. And so I want to continue talking about times when we are most at risk of entering a danger zone. Just a quick review. We went through the first five. Let me give you the headings for those. You know that you're entering a danger zone, number one, when we begin to drift away from healthy pride towards self-sufficiency. Number two, when we begin to drift away from desire toward desperation. Number three, when we begin to drift away from normal balance of life toward exhaustion. We know we're entering a danger zone, number four, when we begin to drift away from community toward isolation. And number five, we know we're entering a danger zone when we begin to drift away from values and standards toward rationalization and justification. I want to look at number six and number seven. Number six, you know you are entering a danger zone when we begin to drift away from pursuing God toward worldly pleasure. Now, I want you to listen to me very closely. There are things in this world that are not evil or bad in and of themselves. But they become evil when your pursuit of those pleasures is greater than your pursuit of God and the things of God. I talked about this a little bit in danger zone number four. Because there are some of us in this room and we need to hear this today. And I'm so glad you're here today because some of you, I haven't seen you in a while. And I'm so glad I see you today. Because here's what happens. We begin and I see people drifting away toward isolation. I talked about the reality that some of you, you've dropped out of ministry. You miss church more often than you come to church now. Your joy level has begun to plummet. And when you do come to church, many of you sit as far back as possible on days unlike today, hoping that Bishop won't see me. Others of you come in late and then you leave early because you want to get out before the prayer of blessing. Some of you were so eager to learn and you were here every Wednesday night because you wanted the word of God. And here's the problem that I see. It's really hard 
Because some of you know that you belong in this church, you belong in this atmosphere, but you feel disconnected because you have, in essence, disconnected. You are still attached, but you are not connected. And here's how it happens. Listen to me very closely, church. Most of us do not walk away from God intentionally. Here's what happens. We don't leave because of bad things. We don't leave because we have been offended, but we leave because we begin to drift. Here's what happens. We get a dream. We get a vision. We get a business desire. We get opportunities. We get pursuits for other things. Our kids get involved in sports, and all these things come up. And I could give you a list of things that are not bad things. They are good things. But here's the problem. You have allowed those good things, those worldly things, to consume your time and take the place of your pursuit of God. Second Chronicles 1.1 1, 1 says this. Now Solomon the son of David was strengthened in his kingdom. And the Lord his God was with him and exalted him exceedingly. Drop down to verses 6 through 12 and listen to what it says. And Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of meeting, and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. On that night God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask. What shall I give you? And Solomon said, God, you have shown great mercy to my David, my father, and have made me king in his place. Now, O Lord, let your promise to David, my father, be established. For you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Now give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come before the people. For who can judge this great of people of yours? Now, I want us to have a moment of truth just for a moment. If God came down and said that to us, and he said, ask, and whatever you want, you can have it, what would we do? The first thing most of us would do is this. Oh, God, give me more stuff. Give me a big house so I can entertain my guests. Give me a nicer, newer, more expensive car, because if I get in a more expensive car, it'll be in the shop a whole lot less. God, if you just give me a man or give me a woman, I'll try to be true to you all the days of my life. Oh, God, please speak to my boss about giving me a raise. Please ask him to give me that promotion. Please, God, make my business prosper, and if you do, I will try tithing. God, please. Allow me to be able to get my college degree. Please, 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 please give me more stuff. And listen now, most of us would ask God for stuff. In fact, we preachers would do the same thing. You know what I thought about when I first heard him ask Solomon, say, ask what you want? I said, what would I ask for? The first thing I would say as a preacher, oh, God, give me a bigger building so we can do the work of the kingdom. God, give me more money so we can hire more staff, so we can do greater things. God, please, please, please give me stuff. And all these things are good things, church. But Solomon knew something that I want you to know. Solomon knew that the key to everything that you need is not to ask God for stuff. But Solomon said, God, give me more of you. Give me more of your wisdom. Now watch what God said when Solomon said that in verse 11. Then God said to Solomon, because this was in your heart and you have not asked for riches or wealth or honor or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked for long life, but you have asked for wisdom. You've asked for more of me and knowledge for yourself that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. Now stop right there. Because Solomon asked me, will you get what you ask for? When you want something from God, you got to be specific. you got to say, God, this is what I want. And so he got what he asked for, but here's what I love. Because he had things in the right order, because he had his priorities straight, listen to what God says. He says, not only am I going to give you great wisdom, not only am I going to give you great knowledge, he goes on to say, I will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had who were before you, nor shall any after you have the like. I want you to see this. Solomon decided that the pursuit of God was the most important thing in his life. And God not only gave him the wisdom and the knowledge, but God gave him stuff he didn't even need. See, here's where we get in trouble, church. It is that we get so consumed in our good but worldly pursuits that we leave God in the dust. So many times we begin to put God and his kingdom on the back burner. His kingdom and the pursuit of him become secondary to our worldly pursuits. And what is so tragic about it is this. 
We all can quote Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And we believe that and we mean it. But listen to me. Let me tell you what happens to us. While at the same time we're quoting this scripture, we are drifting away from pursuing him first toward pursuing what we desire. Second Chronicles 7, 12 through 20. God came to Solomon by night and he tells him again. He says, Solomon, I've heard your prayer. And I love what he said. He said, Solomon, listen, my ears, my eyes, they're going to be focused in this place. And everything that you desire, everything that you ask for, if the people will stay holy, if they will pray, if they will seek my face. He says, I want you to know if they will keep pursuing me. He said, I will hear them and everything they desire, I will give to them. But watch what he says. In the same breath, he tells you, now here's what's going to happen if you begin to pursue the worldly things over your relationship with me. God says, I'll begin to walk through that place, and I'll take everything that was blessed, and I will turn it upside down. And if you're not careful, all the people that were cheering you on while you were pursuing your worldly pursuits in spite of your relationship with me, he says, I'll make it so devastating that those people will walk by, they will shake their heads, and they will say, How, why has the Lord done this to this land and this house and then they will answer because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers now watch this God gives a specific word to Solomon what does he say to Solomon he says Solomon stay away from foreign women why did he say stay away from foreign women stay with me for a moment first Kings 11 1 through 3 but King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonians, and the Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Now, I want you to stop and notice something that God says. He says this to Solomon, but he says this to all of the children of Israel. He says it to the whole congregation. He says, do not intermarry with people who are foreign what was he talking about he said here's why you don't do it because surely they will turn your heart after their gods but the bible says solomon clung to these in love now watch this whenever we begin to pursue other things more than we pursue god here's the issue we begin to make some insane decisions watch what happens when Solomon starts pursuing these foreign women, verse 3 says, and he had 700 wives and princesses. I'm going to say it one more time. I don't know how any man can have 700 wives. I can't keep up with one. We go shopping, and I look for Lady Brenda. Where'd she go? Where'd she go? Where'd she go? She's off somewhere. I, listen, security tells me, boy, she's like a bullet, isn't she? I don't know how Solomon hung out with 700 women. Then it goes on to say, and his wives turned away his heart. The dude had 300 concubines. Do you understand that was 1,000 women? That's a good place for a Sela moment. Just let it settle. And the Bible said that what they did was they turned his heart away from God. Let me ask you a question. Who are you married to today? What are you married to today? What is your wife today? What is greater, your greater pursuit than you know, your relationship with God? Notice what God said. He didn't talk about how evil these wives were. He talked about their pursuit of other gods. And God said, you shall have no other gods before me. Let me talk to you for a minute. You need to have visions and you need to have dreams. You need to have pursuits. But you must be very careful. I must be very careful of not making those things and setting them up as gods in our lives. Let me tell you the danger of making something other than God your God. Because if they, you ever lose that God, will you lose your way? And so God says, you shall have no other gods before me. And we begin to pursue something that is so wonderful, and we have no intention of allowing it to interfere with our relationship with God. But watch what happens. Let me tell you how this works. Here's how it works. God gives us a vision. God gives us a dream. We begin to chase that vision and that dream. And listen, how many of you understand that a vision and a dream has a price? How many of you understand that if it's really from God, it's going to cost you something? It's going to cost, some of you need to understand and you see it that in order to have your vision of your business, you had to spend some money to make some money. 
And before you started making money, you had to spend a lot of money and you're going, I'm not making any money. It seems like I'm losing money. But what you're really understanding is that you're investing money and eventually what you invested will come back to you. But here's the problem that I see. We begin to invest our time, our talent, and our treasure trying to reach our visions and our dreams. And we begin to do these things. And then pretty soon we begin to realize that all of this investment I'm putting into my vision and my dream is taken away from all the other pleasures in my life. Now I don't have time to go here, time to go there, time to do this, time to do that. And all of a sudden we say, hey, all of this hard work is making Jack a dull boy. And then we go, something's got to give. But here's the problem. Where do we always make something give at? On God's hand. We stop coming to church like we used to. We stop reading the word like we used to. You see, we make time for our other pursuits. We make up time for those, but we stop pulling back and start pulling back. Because let me ask you something. When you get in financial trouble, where do you first pull back? Uh-huh. I got three honest people in this room. That's what we do. I'm tempted to do it. The, the first time I see money get tight, the first thing I'm going to do, well, you know what? I'll just hold off and I'll pay my tithe double next month. Liar, liar, pants on fire. We mean well, but listen to me very closely. That's the way the enemy lulls us away from God's house. He lulls us away from relationship with God. And the next thing you know, your pursuit of worldly pleasure has become not only more important than your pursuit of God, but it becomes your spiritual demise, which leads me to number seven. You know you're nearing a danger zone when we begin to drift away from a thankful heart toward a haughty heart. From a thankful heart toward a haughty heart. And what we're talking about here is arrogance. Let me say it again. Pride and arrogance are not the same thing. We all need some healthy pride. We all need to have a healthy dose of, hey, I am somebody. Because I believe that Michael mentioned this and it's said in Psalm 8 that we are the only thing created in his image and his likeness. We are the closest thing to God. So we need to have a healthy pride. But let me say something. That when healthy pride begins to become negative pride, it morphs into arrogance. And again, I had so much fun defining for you what arrogance against means from the Webster Dictionary. I'm not going to spare you like I didn't spare the first service. I'm going to define it all over again. This was so much fun. Are you ready? What is arrogance? It's an exaggerated sense of one's importance. It's haughtiness, imperiousness, loftiness, pompousness, my favorite word, superciliousness, pretentiousness, superiority, smugness, self-satisfaction, self-centeredness, self-conceit. And how do we get that way, church? We forget what God brought us through. We forget what God, where God brought us from. But let me tell you what I've noticed. There's something else I noticed about people when they entered this danger zone. When you become arrogant, appearance means everything. The way you look, the way people perceive you, perceive you, it means everything to you. We preachers are guilty of that. I have seen preachers sacrifice their family on the altar of appearance because of our arrogance. There was one pastor, his daughter went through a divorce, and he was more concerned about the reflection that it would have on his ministry than he was about the pain that was in her heart. He never once sat her down and said, honey, I don't agree with you going through this divorce, but I want you to know you are my daughter and I love you and I'm going to stick by you. You know what he did? He kicked her out of the church and out of his house because he said, you're hurting my ministry. Listen now. Proverbs 16 and 18 applies to preachers and parishioners. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. See, understand this arrogance is a poison of the soul. See it, pride, unhealthy pride is what sets us up for destruction. And if left unchecked, it morphs into a haughty spirit, which is arrogance. And it is what poisons our soul just before we fall. I want you to think about all the people you've seen fall. Preachers, presidents, politicians, all the people you've seen fall. And I'll guarantee you, every one of them, they started out where they moved toward an unhealthy pride and it went and morphed into arrogance. And I want to say something. If you're hanging around someone who is arrogant, you ought to start backpedaling right now. Because they are a danger to you. 
Proverbs 16 and 19 says, better to be of humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Because how many of you understand that the arrogant never go down by themselves? They always take a bunch of people down with them. Let me show you how the poison of arrogance seeps into our soul. There's a young man that I know of. His name was Kurt. He got out of college and he was serving God and mankind. That was his highest goal. He was a good husband, a father, a businessman, and a civic leader. Kurt had everything going for him. Everyone noticed that he had superior leadership qualities, and soon his friends in the community asked him to run for the office of county commissioner. His Christian commitment, listen now, his Christian commitment and his reputation of honesty and his family values got Kurt elected. In spite of the heavy workload of the new position, he continued to make for his time for his wife and his family. Before long, his excellent work as commissioner brought his name and reputation before the political party officials. And when the position of state senator for his district came open, they urged him to run for the office. Now listen, this is why I tell all of us, take praise and criticism with the same weight. Don't think too much of either one, because believe me when I tell you this, you're never as good as some people tell you you are, and you surely are never as bad as most people think you are. Here's what I want to say to you. Take criticism with a light weight. Only learn from it. Then you'll never have to worry when people criticize you because they're so trying to hurt you. It won't hurt you. If you don't put too much weight into it. But let me say something else. Take lightly the praise of men. Because that way when men praise you, if they turn on you and some will, it will not hurt you because you weren't doing it for them in the first place. Number two, if you take the praise of men lightly, it will keep your head from swelling up so big that we can't get you through the church door. Let me tell you something. No matter how wonderful people say you are, there are three entities that really do know who you really are. God, yourself, and your family. Let me talk to men directly in this room just for a moment. Men, let me say something to us. It doesn't matter what people in this church say about you. It doesn't matter what other people say about you. What matters is what your family says about you. Let me tell you how I feel. I want you to love me. I want you to care about me. I want you to think highly of me. But at the end of the day, I don't really care what you think as long as my wife and my daughters respect me when I pillow my head. Here's why. Because no matter how I fake it in church, they really know me. You want to know truly about a man. Watch the way he treats his family. Listen to how he not only talks about his wife, but listen to how he talks to his wife. There's a man who just died recently. And a lady said to us, he was the meanest man I've ever seen. I couldn't believe the way that he talked to his wife. Now understand this. This man was a Christian and this woman who said this is married to a non-Christian. She said, he is so mean. I can't believe the way that he talks to his wife. And then she said, and I thank God for my unsaved husband because he's a good man. How tragic that a man of God is called mean, but a non-Christian is called a good husband. You see, only three people really know who we are, men. God, self, and family. And when Kurt was encouraged to run for office, his wife, Carol, the one who really knew him, wisely said to him, be sure that this is what you should do. She could sense that Kurt was yielding to the poison of arrogance. She could sense that he was yielding to the pull that beyond his desire to serve. It was more about position and power than service. Let me tell you, we all have to guard against this. I have had to turn down opportunities to serve on boards. And the reason that I did that was because I knew that I couldn't give them the time that they really deserved and that they needed from my commitment. But let me tell you a tiny little secret. There have been times when I have been asked to serve on boards, and let me tell you something, there was a desire to serve on those boards, not because it was something I should do, but something that I could do. You see, there were times in my life when I wanted to serve in positions because it was another badge of honor. It was something else to hang on my wall. It was something else to say, look what I am doing. And that's why I've learned to humble myself. That even when I'm asked to serve on a board, I ask God, is that what I should do? Watch this now. And Kurt won 
But listen closely, after his election as a state senator, Kurt's life changed drastically. He was now on top. He had everything he wanted at the Capitol. He had people to meet and appearances to make. Here's the problem. His life became his job. Now he belonged to the public, leaving little or no time for his family. He used to have long discussions with his wife, and they enjoyed those discussions. Now they were few and far between. Listen now, when Carol frequently mentioned church or the family to Kurt, her cautions went unheeded, especially when he, she pushed too hard. And she would remind him, maybe you ought to spend more time with me and with the kids. But her warnings consistently fell on deaf ears. And this young couple, their marriage fell apart as position and power consumed him. Greed got a foothold on Kurt's life. Everybody listen to me. The devil's ability to poison our souls with arrogance ultimately comes to us either by known or unknown desire for power. And we look around and we can see one another and some of us would say, but I don't desire power. Ask yourself the question, is that really true? Because see, I have found that the person who says I am humble, be leery of them. Watch now. And it all starts with a toehold of unhealthy pride. And then it bursts itself into a foothold of greed and power. And here's the danger of arrogance. Please hear this. Everyone could see this in Kurt's life but him. In 37 plus years of ministry, Lady Brenda and I have not had much success with counseling people. Let me tell you why. Because you will sit in a room with us and we will tell that person, I see this, this, and this in your life. And they will look at me and look me dead in the eye and say, that's not me. And everybody else can see the issue, but they can't. And everybody could see it in Kurt. But he couldn't. And in Kurt's life, it wasn't long before he had to be with his goals and his people to accomplish his goals. And Carol said, I felt like he no longer needed me. And her feelings became reality when she learned that he was being unfaithful. With their marriage in shambles, Carol and Kurt separated, leaving their children's lives deeply bruised. Listen to me, married couples. There is nothing in this world that is worthy of you allowing the enemy to destroy your family. If one of you has been unfaithful, repent of your sin, get yourself into counseling and get your marriage healed because your children, they are more valuable than you running off because you had to fulfill the lust of your flesh. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace.